In this video, we start to explain the molecular orbital theory diagrams for polyatomic molecules by taking a look at the peptide bond. Uh, so the peptide bond that we're trying to explain is right here. Uh, and there's a key characteristic of that bond, which is uh, that it's planar, uh, that uh, molecular orbital theory uh, is able to explain very successfully. Okay, uh, when, this, uh, when I say that this moiety is planar, what it means is that uh, this atom, that atom, this atom, and this atom, they're actually all in the same plane. Okay? And again, I, uh, it's something that uh, we need to explain uh, because it's not very obvious. In principle, you would actually have uh, potentially bond rotation around uh, what looks like a single bond, and that should, should destroy planarity. But we know that in reality, um, this moiety is actually planar. Okay, so uh, the way that we're going to explain the bonding in this moiety is by using a hybrid of balance bond theory and molecular theory. First, we're going to try to describe the sigma bonding structure uh, with valence bond theory. Okay? Something that is very important is to uh, try to recognize what the initial shapes, uh, hybridizations of the atomic orbitals would be. Okay, so we notice that if we look at carbon, right? the electron group arrangement is three. You have one, two, three groups of, of, of electrons. And then for nitrogen, uh, you'll have one, two, three, four. And then for oxygen, you'll have one, two, and three. Okay, uh, so looks like this would be sp2, looks like this would be sp2 as well, and then uh, looks like this would be sp3. But the problem with sp3 uh, in the nitrogen atom is that uh, that would not explain that this moiety is planar. We know that sp3 gives you a tetrahedral shape, but sp2 is the one that gives you a planar uh, uh, geometry. Okay, so even though the electron group arrangement of this uh, nitrogen atom would be 4, Okay, uh, because we're trying to explain here that this is a planar uh, molecule, maybe it's more likely that that hybridization is actually also sp2 for nitrogen. Okay, so we're going to depart from uh, uh, the hypothesis here that uh, every single of these uh, three atoms is sp2 hybridized. Okay, so with that, what we're actually going to do then is draw uh, uh, the hybrid uh, electronic configurations for each one of the atoms. Okay, so for carbon, we know that you will have three sp2 uh, orbitals, okay, and one uh, and hybrid orbital that I'm going to choose arbitrarily to make it the 2PC, okay? And the electronic configurations are going to be like this. You have four valence electrons for carbon, it's a 2S2, 2P2, okay, and those uh, uh, four electrons are going to be uh, placed like this, okay? So that would be the electronic configuration for carbon, okay, with sp 2 hybridization. Let's go to oxygen then. Oxygen uh, is also going to be an sp2 uh, hybrid uh, type of uh, structure. And then we have here the 2pc and hybrid. But in the oxygen, we actually have six um, electrons. It's a 2s2, 2p4, in the valence. Okay, so those six electrons are going to be like these. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, we also have nitrogen which again, we're assuming that it, it undergoes sp2 hybridization. And then uh, for nitrogen, you will have uh, sp2 hybridize. That will be the 2pc. And um, you have that nitrogen has five electrons. It's a 2s2, 2p3. Okay, so the five electrons are going to be one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, uh, so we'll actually have to explain why we're choosing here to place two electrons and not in the other cases, for example, in oxia. Okay, but that's, that's something that we can do a little bit later on. Now, uh, the next step then is to uh, put these orbitals in space and see what type of overlaps you will have between them. Okay, so again, uh, trigonal planar means that you're going to have three orbitals that are 120 degrees from each other. Okay, and then you will have a perpendicular uh, a 2 pc orbital. Okay, so the way that we're going to choose to draw this is to draw uh, the, all of the sp2 orbitals for each one of the atoms in this plane, which we're going to call the xy plane. And what that means is that perpendicular to the plane, we will have the 2pc and heavy orbitals. Okay, so uh, in the first part of this uh, uh, bonding explanation, we're going to only explain uh, the sigma bonds, okay, as overlaps between sp2 uh, uh, hybrid orbitals in the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Okay, and this is what I have drawn already right here. It takes a little bit to, uh, uh, to draw. But that's what we have. Okay, so let's take a look at carbon. I think we're trying to draw here the uh, sigma structure. Okay, so we're only worrying right now about the, about the sp2 orbitals, not about that 2pc two, uh, uh, two and hybrid orbital. That's carbon. The sp2 hybrid orbitals would be 1, 2, 3 in this plane, 
and 120 degrees from each other. Okay, each one has one electron, and uh, uh, that will be the structure of uh, carbon. Now, what about oxygen? We look at oxygen, and again, you will also have three uh, sp2 uh, uh, hybrid orbitals in this plane, okay, with 120 degrees between each other. Okay, this is the one that is singly occupied, and that's uh, the two that are doubly occupied. Okay, those two are these two. Okay, so you can clearly see how, uh, uh, because this sp2 of carbonano has only one electron, and that sp2 of the oxygen only has one electron, uh, you can form there a sigma overlap, which explains one of these two bonds in the Lewis dot structure. Okay, that is uh, uh, that bond is a sigma overlap between an sp2 and an sp2 hybrid orbital of oxygen and carbon. Okay, so we've already explained that. I notice that these lone pairs would actually uh, be uh, these two uh, W occupied sp2 hybrid orbitals. All right, what about uh, this bond and then nitrogen? Okay, so what will happen for nitrogen is that when we take these sp2 orbitals again, uh, the idea is that those are in the same plane, the plane of the whiteboard and they will be 120 degrees from each other. Notice that each one of them is singly occupied, one electron, one electron, one electron, and then what happens is that here you will have one electron from carbon atom, one electron from the nitrogen atom, that is also uh, uh, good for a sigma overlap between the carbon and nitrogen atom. Okay, so we have explained already what that bond is. All right, and then uh, you will have the rest of the structure, right? So notice that this, uh, the bond between this R and this carbon atom would be uh, due to an overlap with this um, uh, S2, uh, uh, hybrid orbital in carbon, uh, that NR prime would be very similar. You will have here some orbital in the R, uh, R prime OAT, and uh, you will find another sigma orbital. And then for hydrogen, that bond would be like this. That would be the wave function of the hydrogen atom, 1s, then one electron, that would be another sigma uh, overlap. Okay, so great. That actually explains the skeleton, the sigma bonding of the peptide bond but it still does not explain why this sh should be planar, okay? Why you actually uh, can have, cannot have a rotation around uh, this axis. This is only a single, a single bond, sigma bond, okay? So in principle, there should be rotation. So the question is, why is this planar, right? So notice that uh, uh, we actually, until now, we have forgotten about the unhybrid PC orbitals, right? Notice that in oxygen, you're going to have an, unhy an unhybrid 2PC orbital coming in the plane, is this 2PC in carbon? You're also going to have an orbital like that coming out of the plane, 2PC with one electron. And in nitrogen, you're going to have the same orbital, but in this case, it will be doubly occupied. Okay? So what we're going to do now is erase the sigma bonding and then worry about what happens uh, for the interactions of these uh, three 2PC orbitals, one uh, from each of the atoms, that are coming in and out of the plane. Okay, to make the drawing a little easier, what we're actually going to do is rotate the molecule so the two PCs are not pointing uh, inside and outside of the whiteboard, but instead they're going to be now pointing up and down in this whiteboard. And so again, we erase this, we already understand the sigma uh, structure. Now what we actually want to do is understand what happens with the uh, uh, pi structure, okay? How are these uh, orbitals that are hybrid in each one of the atoms and they're pointing in the same direction? How do they uh, uh, overlap or how do they mix to generate molecular orbitals? Right, so again, we have here, uh, if I draw those uh, atoms in a line, okay, which in which I have rotated the molecule, you will have here uh, the 2PC of oxygen with one electron, then you will have here the 2PC uh, of carbon, one electron, and then we'll have the 2PC of nitrogen with two electrons. Right, so now what we're actually going to do is use um, molecular orbital theory to explain uh, how the bonding uh, uh, between these three atomic orbitals takes place, how, right, or how can you, can you can generate molecular orbitals that involve all three atomic orbitals. This is something beyond what we have studied until now, because everything that we have studied until now with molecular orbital theory involve combinations of orbitals between only two atoms. In this case, we're going beyond, this will be a polyatomic molecule, and we're uh, drawing here uh, linear combinations or molecular orbitals that uh, go beyond two atoms and engage three in this case. Okay, so great. Uh, all right, this is actually not going to be very dif different from what we have done until now. So it turns out that uh, when you mix three uh, atomic orbitals, you can get three molecular orbitals. The question is, well, how are those mixings? And uh, how do we learn about bonding, non-bonding, anti-bonding, and so forth? Okay, so I'm actually going to draw here uh, these, the three linear combinations from which you can get three molecular orbitals from the three atomic orbitals. 
again, we should be uh, quite careful in determining which one of those is bonding, which one is anti-bonding, and so forth. Okay, so the first one would be one in which the three two PC orbitals are all in phase. Okay, that is your oxy atom, carbon atom, and nitrogen atom. Then again, there is a two PC, there's a total of four electrons, okay? But the first possible combination is that in which all of the orbitals are in phase. Okay, so if you actually have this linear combination, notice that the molecular orbital that you would get, be generating would be something like this, O, C, N. Okay, notice that all of those are in phase, so you can have here uh, that molecular orbital, right? Clearly, this is a pi molecular orbital, okay, because there's no cylindrical symmetry, and uh, we actually see that it's a bonding orbital, okay, because, well, uh, the electrons can be in between the three atoms at the same time, and that should give rise to a bonding that expands not to uh, two atoms, but the three of them. Okay? So that would be the bonding uh, orbital that has the lowest energy. All right, the next combination that you can think about is uh, the following. This is oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. Okay, so I can draw uh, the linear combination as this, but this one uh, will be uh, zero, Okay, and that one will be negative or positive. Okay, so in the second combination, we can actually say that, well, the second combination will have a positive coefficient for oxygen, a zero coefficient for uh, carbon, and a negative coefficient for the 2PC of nitrogen. Okay, so uh, when we actually draw, uh, the resulting molecular orbital is going to look something like this. Uh, here you're gonna have a positive region, and then that's going to become negative, so negative, ah, sorry. Let's try to see if we can draw this again. Okay, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. Okay, so the idea is that, well, here you can have a region that is positive, uh, and the orbital is negative here, the orbital is uh, negative here, the orbital is positive here. Okay, so what type of molecular orbital is this? Well, um, it's not perfectly bonded. Right, because there is a node right at the carbon atom uh, where the wave function changes sign. Okay, but it's uh, slightly bonding because, well, you can actually have that. There is a region where there's not a node in between uh, the carbon and the oxygen atom, okay, and the carbon and the nitrogen atom. Okay, the node is right at the carbon atom, okay, right here, but you still have some bonding between carbon and nitrogen and some bonding between oxygen and carbon. Okay, so that is uh, uh, neither bonding nor anti bonding, uh, it's moderately bonding. Okay, it's clear now as well as this one, uh, but that's the second molecular orbital you can have. Okay, so what would be the, uh, the last one? Okay, the last molecular orbital would be uh, that that emerges from a linear combination that is like this. Okay, so plus, minus, uh, plus. And when you actually try to draw here the molecular orbital uh, that would emerge from there, it would look like this. Okay, so you would have plus, minus, and then you would have minus, uh, plus, and then you will have plus, minus. Okay, the key here is that there is a node in between each one, uh, each pair of atoms, right? So there's a node right here, and there is a node right there. Clearly, this is something that we call anti-bonding. So there will be a pi anti-bonding orbital. This is clearly a pi bonding orbital. Okay, and this is something that is in between. Okay, so in some regions you have bonding uh, character, but in some other regions you have anti-bonding characters, there is a node. Okay, but the, the idea is that, again, uh, using three different atoms, or atomic orbitals in three different atoms, you can generate three molecular orbitals that expand the three atoms. Okay, they extend the length of the three atoms. Now, in energy, clearly this is going to be much more energy, much uh, more stable than that, and this will be in the middle. Okay, so we can then uh, go on to the molecular orbital theory diagram uh, and uh, draw how this would look like in terms of energy. Okay, so when we do this, uh, then what will happen is that this orbital will be the lowest energy, and we can call it the pi orbital. Okay, this orbital will be the highest energy, that would be the pi star. And this orbital, uh, which we're not even going to name, okay, uh, uh, is actually going to be in the middle. Okay, so the idea here is that you have four electrons. Okay, so uh, the first electrons will go right there, the other two electrons will go right there. And then we can also try to calculate here the uh, uh, bond order. Okay, notice that you have two electrons in bonding orbitals, no electrons in anti-bonding orbitals, and then these two electrons 
uh, are, are for all practical purposes non-bonding. Okay, so we can say that there's a bond, or, bond order one. Now this is very interesting because again, this explains why this molecule is planar. The idea is that when you actually take a look at the pi structure, there is a molecular orbital that is bonding that expands, extends the length of these three atoms, right? That it will be plus and minus. This is very uh, hard to visualize uh, when the molecule is drawing this plane, but when you actually uh, look at the pi bonding, again, it's very easy to see that you have a bonding molecular orbital that, again, goes through the three atoms, and uh, this bond is something that would be broken if you now try to rotate this out of the plane. Okay, so the presence of this pi bond that is not localized between the carbon and the oxygen atom, as the Lewis structure suggests, but instead it actually expands the length of the peptide bond, that is what causes planarity in the peptide bond. And we know the planarity in the peptide bond is uh, responsible for a variety uh, of interactions uh, between uh, peptide chains. And again, it's, it's highly responsible for a lot of the structures that we see in proteins. Okay, so again, this is the kind of uh, an application of how molecular orbital theory would be uh, applied to molecules with more than two atoms. Here you have three atoms, and again, drawing here this uh, separate three atoms is very difficult. We simply have the energy diagram and an idea for how the linear combinations could take place. But again, uh, I think that what is more important about this example is to recognize that molecular orbitals can are not localized to just two atoms. They can actually uh, uh, be localized to more than two atoms. And again, in the case of the peptide bond, is the presence of a delocalized pi molecular orbital, okay, in between the oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen bonds, and nitrogen atoms, that causes uh, uh, the planarity in that moiety.